OpenAI just announced a, a new bioscience partnership. And at the same time, Microsoft and Apple both dropped their OpenAI seats, their board seats. As AI takes over, make this your mantra. Let the robots do the work. Subscribe to stay on top of AI news. Now, Microsoft was already on the board of OpenAI, and there was speculation that Apple will be joining the board as well. In fact, in the last couple of days, they've announced that it was happening. But today, it seems like they did a full 180 and are saying that they're both either leaving the board or not planning to take part of the board effective immediately. Now, there seems to be a lot of urgency because, again, Microsoft is uh, basically sending them a letter saying right now, right away. And Apple's saying, yeah, we're not going in there. Nope. And they're declining to comment as to why. Now, what could be behind this move? Well, there's some antitrust worries, both in the U.S. and the EU. They're kind of looking at that partnership between these big monopoly companies and open AI, and they're getting a little bit worried. Now, the official position by Microsoft, at least, was that the position that they had on OpenAI's board had provided insights into the board's activities without compromising its independence. It was sort of an observer role, looking into what OpenAI was doing, but not really interfering. However, since then, they've witnessed significant progress from the newly formed board, and they're confident in the company's direction. The role is no longer necessary. Now, it looks like both the European Commission said in June it was exploring the possibility of an antitrust investigation. Same thing with the FTC here in the US. Lisa Kahn has made a few appearances talking about the problems with these big tech monopolies and how AI plays into it. And it does seem like this move to not take these board positions to open AI, it's unlikely to resolve the agency's concerns. But it does seem like it's going to make it harder for these antitrust regulators are on both sides of the Atlantic, US and EU, to prove that Microsoft has, you know, undue influence over OpenAI. It's going to make it harder for them to prove otherwise. In the meantime, OpenAI and Los Alamos a National Laboratory announced bioscience research partnership. What's interesting to me here is that the Manhattan Project, the project to discover the nuclear bomb, did happen in Los Alamos as well. But we'll, we'll get back to that in just a second because there's a few more announcements that are just happening right now. The first one is that OpenAI is rolling out its text-to-speech API to the playground. So you're able to just kind of play around with it, produce voices. They have six different voices that you can use and kind of get your hands on it and test it out in the playground, the OpenAI playground. And interestingly, it does look like you can download it, which is kind of a game changer because you could use this basically for free. I've used the text to speech with the, I think they have six different voices, used it for the voice assistant that I've showed on this channel. It works great. I think here the added benefit, the added functionality is that you can actually just download whatever thing you have, which almost kind of seems like it kind of puts them on a competition course with 11 labs. Of course, 11 labs, that's kind of the whole point of it is you create voices that you type in whatever you want. The AI voice says that thing, and then you're able to download that audio file and use it wherever you want to. So here's kind of what that looks like. The text-to-speech appears here. You're able to choose from six different voices. Alloy is the default. You're able to do text-to-speech one or text-to-speech one HD, as well as looks like the playback, how quickly they say it, and whether you want it as an MP3 or a WAV file or something similar. Let's try it out. Fly, you fools. And they have these uh, generations on the right-hand side here. And let's try a different voice, Echo. Get to the chopper. Get to the chopper. And I can download that and have that file. That is pretty cool, I gotta say. Neat. In other news, Mira Mirati is saying that... Sora is not quite ready for prime time yet. Take a listen. Speaking of Sora this week, uh, Ashton Kutcher told Eric Schmidt, what an interesting pair. Um, I have a beta version of it, and it's pretty amazing. He also said the bar is going to go way up because why are you going to watch my movie when you could just watch your own movie? He's basically saying people will be able to type out their movie in their head, and AI will turn it a movie they can watch. Right now it's quite crude, but it, does it sound plausible to you? And, and when will SOAR be ready for public uh, release? We don't have a timeline for public release for SORA yet. Uh, what we're doing right now with SORA is we, we've given access to red teamers and we've given access to some content creators to help us identify ways to make this robust. We're doing a lot of work on safety front, uh, but also to figure out how do we actually bring this to the public in a way that's useful. Um, that's not very straightforward. Right now, it's really a technology. Mm -hmm. um, and this has been 
a pretty consistent process that we have followed with every new technology that we have developed. We will usually work with those that have, uh, like for example with DALI, we worked with creators initially and they helped us identify ways to create an interface that where they felt you know, more empowered, and they could do, uh, they could create uh, more so, projects yeah, and make right. it, yeah. Basically, you just want to extend the creativity of. But let's come back to this OpenAI and Los Alamos partnership in biosciences. So the point of it is to understand how AI can be used safely by scientists in laboratory settings to advance bioscientific research. Here in the U.S., they passed a safe AI law, the development and use of artificial intelligence. Were they tasked the U.S. Department of Defense National Labs to help evaluate the capability of these frontier AI models, the best of the best, including their ability in various biological tasks, creating potentially some bioviruses or anything that could be harmful. So it could be viruses, drugs, compounds, you name it. It looks like one of the interesting things that they're testing is they're seeing how GPT-40 can assist humans who are performing tasks in a physical lab setting through multimodal capabilities like vision and voice. All right, so they mentioned that this feature is yet unreleased, but this is the real-time voice system that we're hoping to see sometime later this year. But from playing around with building my own kind of little voice assistants, I use the text-to-speech API that I've just shown in the, in the previous segment. The assistant itself could be Gemini or GPT-40. Now more and more, it's Claude 3.5 Sonnet. And you can have it be a voice assistant with no vision, or you can hook it up to your webcam so it's able to see what your web camera is seeing and respond to questions about that. Or it can respond to screenshots of your computer. So certainly having an assistant like that helping you as you work in a lab or office or anywhere else, I could see the potential for that. And of course, the other big part is the bio-risk threat evaluation to see is it possible these AI models create compounds or output any text that can help with the creation of some sort of a bio threat or can create any text that will help with the creation of anything that has any bio threat risk. It's interesting that they're testing things that serve as a proxy for more complex tasks that pose a dual use concern. They mentioned tasks like introducing foreign genetic material into a host organism, maintaining and propagating cells in vitro and cell separation through centrifugation. So this is very interesting because, of course, this could really upskill existing professionals, PhDs, as well as novices. It could help them get the information they need, upskill them, walk them through certain steps, remind them if they're missing anything, answer questions. And, of course, it could be used for nefarious tasks, which is, I think, the thing that they're trying to prevent. This is Lisa Kahn, the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, and she's got a bone to pick with these big tech companies. I don't think she likes them very much. But overall, listening to her talk about AI, the need for open source, the need for decentralization, so not having completely monopolized in the hands of the few big tech companies, certainly a lot of the things that she's saying kind of makes sense to me. Let me know what you think. Here's a clip. And we as policymakers and as a society can help make decisions and choices that are going to steer these technologies on a path that actually serves us rather than a model where a handful of companies are just extracting more and more from society, from creators, and people feel they don't have recourse. And I would say on the antitrust side, we are scrutinizing the entire stack, from the chips to the compute and cloud to the models to the apps, trying to understand what are the kind of key properties of each of these layers. In layers where you are already seeing some bottlenecks, or a handful of companies controlling that stack, how do we make sure that's not being used in anti-competitive ways such that innovators and entrepreneurs are gonna be locked out? I went to Silicon Valley a few months ago and I heard a tremendous amount of excitement from a lot of founders and startups, especially about the potential of open source, which has historically been a key driver of innovation. But there was also some apprehension, in part because there was a recognition that right now, the raw material for a lot of these tools is in the hands of a very small number of companies. And so who's even getting access to the models? Who's getting access to compute and on what terms? All of that seems very opaque to a lot of the founders and startups. And I think there's a concern that, especially if you have vertical integration and conflicts of interest, 
there could be self-dealing, there could be discrimination, there could be exclusion, so that the big guys are just getting bigger at the expense of everybody well, else. Well, is that the logical, maybe inevitable outcome of this process, that the big players who are big now become the big players in the AI space inevitably? Or is there a path that's, where that's not the case? I think this is where you need to look at each layer of the stack. And so, for example, we see you know, significant consolidation in the cloud computing space. You basically have three major players there. Uh, right now we see significant consolidation in the chips layer as well. And we need to understand, is there a path for injecting more competition into these layers? Um, at the very least, we need to make sure that these firms are not using any monopoly power or market power that they may have to entrench that dominance or to exclude competitors. Let me know what you think about that. What is OpenAI and Microsoft leaving very, very rapidly, very quickly the board of OpenAI? What does that mean for the future of AI? What does it mean that both the EU and the US authorities are seemingly very interested in breaking up some of these, what they perceive to be potential AI monopolies? Is this good, bad? Let me know in the comments. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.